I bought this Rigel DS1202 scope nine months ago. It's a 200 megahertz version, so a slightly different model number because sometimes that's useful. And I thought I'd compare it to my Instrastar USB scope that hooks up to a PC, but <laughs> this PC has been powered up for 20 minutes now and it's still not usable, which is one of the reasons I don't use the USB scope very much and uh, why I bought this scope. First thing I'll do is try to probe what's going on inside this power adapter just uh, with a simple inductive loop like this. So I'll just hold this loop on top of this power adapter and you can see right here we've got a uh, signal coming out of it. Not so much in the middle and then on this side we have another signal coming out of it. So that suggests there is a switching type of circuit on this side and another one on this end probably one to condition the voltage coming in and another one to produce the right output voltage. So let's just stop that on here and zoom in. And this is probably the switching frequency of this unit. And so let's turn on our cursors. These are already on. Um, and try to put the, uh, go for the major period here. And cursor B. There, so this is lots of confusing things about the user interface for this thing. So now I've got the cursors on here and that says it's 57 kilohertz, which is pretty typical for a switching, uh, the switching frequency inside one of these adapter type things. And speaking of things that are confusing, uh, the menus on here, if I select this thing here, then I use this knob to select what I want. And quite often then as I push this button, I end up turning it a little bit. So let me just there. Um, that happens quite a lot. So it's a bit of a physical skill to press this button without turning it so that you actually select what you wanted. Um, because you have to push it fairly hard to uh, select. But if we zoom way in on this signal, let's look at this transient here. Um, we can see some uh, relatively fast squiggles. So even though I wasn't looking for high frequency type things, uh, let's put the uh, cursor, move the cursor B. So that's 14 megahertz for the squiggle here, and there's some higher frequency squiggles in here as well. So definitely we get some very high frequency stuff, which is one of the reasons why I paid for the 200 megahertz version. Now this is finally booted up, and I've set it so that I can catch some signals off of this one too. And if I put the uh, probe here, it is picking stuff up as well. Uh, but some of those high frequency transients, it's just barely picking up because those were at several megahertz and this thing only samples at 48 mega samples per second, which is pretty decent. But uh, when you're looking for, uh, when you're looking for very high frequency stuff, it's not enough. There, there's more transients on the other side of it. And we're picking those up very nicely. But the annoying thing is now to zoom in on this one, I have to select this knob, and this knob I have to select the little button and turn it, which is just awkward. So the USB scope's limit is not so much uh, the hardware, the more frustrating thing is how awkward the user interface is on here. And it just makes it no fun to use, which means I only use this if I absolutely have to, as opposed to this, which I can just pull out and use. For my next demonstration, I'm going to probe the current going into this old 8-track motor using a shunt resistor, and I'm just running it off of a DC power supply, running about, I don't know, 10 volts into it. And we'll just also push auto on here again to see if it gets a nice signal out of that. And it did pretty good uh, getting something interesting here. So what's interesting is the uh, current going to this motor is very intermittent because this motor has actually got a little regulator in it which is just a uh, centrifugal switch and when the motor gets up to speed it disconnects that and that's what kept the A-track running at the uh, right speed. So if I now slow this motor down a little bit, now the current has become continuous because now I've applied enough torque that it needs to run the motor continuously to maintain speed. I can also just turn down the voltage a little bit and now the motor needs continuous current because 
there's not enough voltage to uh, actually get up to speed so that centrifugal switch never turns off. Now you'll notice the lines on here are a little bit fuzzy and that's because there's a, a lot of high frequency component in there as well and that gets very annoying in terms of trying to uh, see what's going on. There is of course the uh, bandwidth limit so go in here and we turn the bandwidth limit on so now that's limited to 20 megahertz, which means we get a little bit less of that noise. But still some. I wish there was a way to limit the bandwidth to say just 1 megahertz, But it doesn't have that feature. Now the current signal for this motor is a relatively low bandwidth signal. And this is where something called roll mode becomes very handy. And that's under this menu here. Time base roll. To me, roll mode is... Why is it not running? Oh, run. To me, roll mode is so important, it should really have its own button to just push the button to go roll mode. In fact, an old HP scope, the first scope that I used that had roll mode, had a button for it. Um, and now I can use a time base to select how fast that rolls. And the nice thing about that is, if you've got a very slow signal, you can't just wait for the whole trace to appear. This way, you see the transients straight away. Like, if I slow down this motor, we can see the transients. And we can stop and still have a look at those because we can zoom in by quite a lot to see the waveforms because this thing has a very large trace buffer. But uh, this gets to another annoyance of the scope. As I zoom in on this, um, it's always zooming in with respect to the right edge of the screen. So if I go on here, see the right edge always stays in place and that's counterintuitive when you're scrolling around and looking for something in here because I do that actually quite a lot because roll mode is very useful in terms of uh, if you've got a signal that you can't really trigger off of uh, say you're looking for some kind of glitch to so just leave roll mode running and then when you say oh there it happened you just stop and then start searching for it in here and uh, it should always zoom in with respect to the middle it does that if I don't use roll mode but in roll mode it's always with respect to the right which is annoying and now back to regular time based mode uh, I've also got the USB scope hooked up and is also in regular time base mode and it's updating the screen about twice per second whereas this thing is updating far faster than that and actually that's limited by how long it takes to get a trace so if I have a shorter thing on the screen it updates much much faster whereas on here now going for this awkward little button to make the time base a bit shorter uh, and it's easy to miss that um, it updates a bit faster now, but uh, I can't for the life of me figure out how to make it just uh, grab the trace that's on the screen as opposed to grabbing a long trace and showing a short piece of it. But we don't have this sort of fuzzy trace like we do on here because this thing just, there seems to be a lot of uh, high bandwidth transients in there as well. Um, now there's, we can also change the display to be dots instead of vectors. And that helps a little bit. Now we can see sort of we've got uh, many signals on top of each other. Um, but it looks a bit weird, uh, this signal, so I don't know what's going on with that. Dots display is sometimes useful. In this case, it doesn't actually make it any better. Now the scope has the ability to process signals in various ways under math. And what I'm going to try now is to actually have it decode an I2C signal coming out of this Raspberry Pi going to this A to D board. So I'll just need to run that processing. And now I'm getting some stuff here. Once again, auto mode. Come on. And processing on here is stopped, so I'll just have to run that again. And now we have some nice uh, I squared C signals on here. So selecting math, um, decode. I've already already got I squared C selected. There's different options. Uh, RS-232, I squared C, and SPI. So, uh, clock is channel 2, data is channel 1, and I'm not getting a signal, but I realized I need to turn this on separately. So let's click this. And now down here we have which bytes that decodes to. And I don't know what's going on here. I'd rather just show the hex values instead of it trying to make some kind of ASCII think out of it. But uh, it does decode the I squared C. I've never actually used this feature. I've only just now tried this out for the sake of this video.
There's also all kinds of uh, measurement options on the left side here to measure pulse widths and duty cycles and phase changes and stuff like that. Uh, personally, I haven't bothered to uh, learn those because unless you're doing a lot of the same measurements, it's easier to just place the cursors and figure it out yourself. I think these would be more useful in a production environment where you're testing thousands of the same sort of thing and just want to have this thing calculate what the uh, pulse width or whatever is and write that down. But uh, all my uses for the scope are one-off, so these things are uh, not really worth the effort to learn. So I have my frustrations with this scope because it's just too darn sophisticated and uh, the knobs can do different things under different modes. But uh, having knobs is so important uh, compared to the USB scope where you have to select the, the knob on the screen with a mouse and try to twist it around and it's just so frustrating because I just want to turn this one knob up by one little click and it's such an awkward operation. Whereas on this thing, just uh, with muscle memory, I can just grab that knob and tweak it, so much better. Knobs are just so much better than uh, any sort of touch screen or mouse interface for something where you're only doing one thing with it. But this scope is in some ways annoyingly sophisticated. Uh, for instance, just to uh, turn it off and then on again, I have to wait quite a while for it to come up, which to some extent reduces the spontaneity of it. Come on. And we're back finally. So it takes longer for that scope to come up than it does for an analog scope to warm up the CRT. So <laughs> the analog scope is more spontaneous. And I do like analog scopes for some things because they're just so responsive and so simple. You don't have to think about what state there is. Everything has its own button and switch. But then using an analog scope, sometimes I'm like, okay, now just hold that signal. And it's like, whoops, there is no hold mode. Oh well. But roll mode of the scope really is the killer feature and uh, I watched a video by EEV blog talking about this scope and he used roll mode on it so I knew it had it. Without that I wouldn't have bought it because with roll mode and the long trace buffer um, it has enough uh, bandwidth even in this mode to capture all of the uh, transients from what's going on with I squared C because it has such a long trace buffer. Only thing is now I wanted to turn on decode for that, but as soon as I went to the roll mode, decode got turned off. And even though I'm not in roll mode right now, because I'm stopped, I still can't turn on the decode, which kind of sucks because if I was looking for some I squared C glitch, this would be really cool to just be able to run this thing. And then say it's like, oh, there's the glitch, and then go find it. Of course, I can always kind of have a look at what's going on with I squared C myself, because chances are the problem isn't so much with the actual bits, but some more obvious transient problem. So yeah, this Wriggle Scope, I like it. Um, it does have some noise on the signal, so if I'm probing for something very small, there seems to be a very high frequency component on there, which I'm pretty sure is coming from the scope, because even if I disconnect the probe from the scope, um, it still shows up. So it's probably some noise that is internal to the scope, so it's not as sensitive as I would like to be. My analog scope doesn't have this problem, but for a lot of things, the analog scope but for a lot of things, the analog scope just isn't usable. And another annoyance of a fancy scope is this thing has a cooling fan built into it. Uh, certainly this doesn't have it, and an analog scope doesn't have it, which is why I don't just leave this thing on, so uh, once I got my measurement, I usually just turn it off. And one more thing, uh, I can plug a USB kind of stick into here and actually save stuff to it, but it has to be DOS formatted, relatively old, so the firmware is not capable of dealing with like uh, Windows NT type file system. So if you want to save stuff, this is where the USB scope actually wins because this PC is hooked up to my network and I can just save it to a network drive. Whereas on here, I have to very awkwardly try to enter a file name or select a pre-existing file name. So for saving things to a computer, the USB scope wins. So the scope ended up costing me almost $500 Canadian by the time I got it. So not terribly cheap, but say half the price of an iPhone and half the price of the camera I'm using to film it. So not too bad, uh, especially considering back in the day when I was working in high tech at RIM, later Blackberry, the scopes I was using were about as sophisticated as this and cost thousands of dollars. So it's really nice that nowadays, real scopes and test equipment like this are well within reach of hobbyists like me.